Hey. Well, I want to thank everybody who is here with us today and everybody or anybody who's online or who will view this. Most importantly, I want to thank Riverside Research and the T-Rex for hosting these events from maps to metaverse. As a prelude to the upcoming USGIF GeoInt conference, which will be held here in St. Louis, very exciting, uh, next month, the end of May. So I'm Sue Calwhite with Deloitte, and I am very pleased to be your moderator today and have the opportunity to introduce our panelists. And before we do that, I'll do a little introduction of myself, and then I also want to share with you all what Deloitte is doing in the area of what we call unlimited reality. So first of all, who am I? Well, I've enjoyed a 23-year career at NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. It included my best job ever, at least so far, which was as the director of analysis. And then an opportunity to work in a role that was at the intersection of my passion for people and what I feel is my purpose or my North Star, which is helping others be their best selves as the culture executive and leadership development executive at NGA. In April of last year, so a little bit over, a couple of days over a year ago, I retired from NGA and I joined Deloitte uh, in May. And at Deloitte, I am responsible or I'm building a business around commercial enabled intelligence, which also includes commercial geoint services and working across the intelligence community to help our clients be their best selves in all that they do. What I love to do if we were on the West Coast and somebody said, well, Sue, what do you do? I would tell them that I do CrossFit and I do anything and everything having to do with Disney. In fact, just this past week, I was at Disney for the third time already this year. I participated in the Pixar 10 mile run. I walked it and I decided that at the six mile marker, that was enough for me. So that was my, my first and last 10 miler, but I think I'll do some 10 Ks. All right. So I'd like to share a little story. About 30 years ago as a GS-12 working at NGA in their legacy organization called the National Photographic Interpretation Center, I had the opportunity to experience a quote, future ops center. I was visiting one of the national labs where they created what they called a holodeck as an immersive ops center experience. While I don't recall the specifics, I do remember the feeling that I had. And that feeling was like being in Star Trek Next Generation and knowing that this was the direction that we should and could eventually get to for our intelligence professionals. I knew that it would happen. I didn't realize it might take 30 years. But I do feel that we are on the cusp of achieving what I felt in that experience 30 years ago. And at Deloitte, we take advantage of all the technologies that are involved in the metaverse, in immersive reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and we call it unlimited reality. I'd like to introduce you to one of our leaders at Deloitte in unlimited reality, Chad Clay. So Chad, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Oh, hi there. Welcome to the Metaverse. Isn't it nice? I'm Chad Clay. Okay, I'm not really Chad. I'm just his avatar. The real Chad is a principal at Deloitte Digital. And I'm, well, I'm a floating torso. I lost my train of thought. Where was I? Ah, yes, the Metaverse. This is the shared place where we can all come together virtually. I know, I know, you're used to doing that on Teams and Zoom, but trust me, getting together in the metaverse is different. The view is better, and it feels like you're with your colleagues versus just staring at them through the screen. And today, I'm here with my colleagues to tell you about Deloitte's unlimited reality practice and its unlimited possibilities. Our unlimited reality practice can help you in all sorts of amazing ways to innovate, to create, to communicate, and to engage with your people. How do we do it? We pair the latest technology, whether it be AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, 
5G, machine learning, digital twins, the list keeps on going. And pair that with our industry expertise to create amazing experiences and capabilities for our clients. Let's check out some examples. Wasn't that cool? Maybe that sparked a few ideas about how unlimited reality can help your organization. Let's connect and chat about the unlimited world of unlimited reality. Thanks, Chad. All right, so I know the music was cool. I thought the music was cool. And I suspect that some of you are saying, okay, but what does that mean to us, right, in the intelligence community? So I'm going to translate some of what you saw into how I view it in support of the intel community. So first of all, as Chad mentioned, we're organized around these three fields of play. And in the first one, the augmented workforce, for me, this is about training, and training in the flow of work. From an intelligence analysis perspective, I can see that I can immerse myself, whether I'm a new analyst, or a new intelligence professional, or I'm new into an account, I can immerse myself using these tools to walk around the locations of interest, to meet persons of interest, to experience past activity as a way to learn or what to expect in the future. I personally am an experiential learner, and the fact that I can immerse myself in the environment that I have to study and analyze and understand and translate for customers will be a very powerful tool. In the enterprise simulation, I'm excited about enterprise simulation as a new means to again immerse myself and my teammates in the intelligence and processes of intelligence analysis. And I'm gonna show you an example of what we mean by that in a moment. And finally, in the X reality, in that world, perhaps our future USGIF GeoInc conferences will be taking advantage of this where we can have participants online in the metaverse and participants in person together and we can share panels and we can exchange views and just imagine the kinds of demonstrations and panels that can happen in the metaverse through that digital means that we can all experience. So as promised, I wanted to talk a little bit about enterprise simulation and what the potential of the future for intelligence analysis might be. And for me, this example is that holodeck. And this is a demonstration that at Deloitte we put together with existing technologies. Now I'll admit it's not ready to be deployed inside the skiff right away, but the fact that the technologies are there and we can put it together so that I can physically immerse myself in all the data. For those of you who knew me as the director of analysis, use all the data was one of my bylines, my hashtags, if you will. And in this immersive experience, I can experience the data all around me and not just read it, but see it, and see how the, the information that's coming from different intelligence sources integrates and works together. I think that's gonna be very powerful, and I'm imagining not only for my intelligence analysis work, 
But when I go to create a product for my customers, not being a static product, but also being an immersive experience. Imagine at an Ops Intel, where suddenly the key leader and those around them are immersed in the intelligence of the day and can start to play what-if scenarios due to the AI that's running behind this about what happens if this moves here or these people say that, et cetera. So I find that very exciting and very, very powerful for our future. If I have to sum up what unlimited reality is in three words, it's these three words. Everything, everywhere, all at once. And what does maps to metaverse mean to me? It means don't just read it, but experience it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first panelist, and I'm going to do a short introduction, and I warn them that I took what I could find in a very quick survey on the internet. And Dane Johnson, who's the director of Omniverse at NVIDIA, I'm gonna... is passionate, very passionate, about taking the PC gaming experience to the next level. And he works tireless, tirelessly with game developers across the world to do so. In his art, in his heart of hearts, Dane is a technical artist who straddles the line between technology and art as close as possible. St. Louis also is a home of sorts for him as he's a SLU grad majoring in aerospace engineering. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dane. All right, <clears throat> All right. thank you. Um, yeah, my name's Dane Johnston. I've been with NVIDIA for uh, about 15 years now. Um, I'm senior director for uh, Omniverse, and uh, I've been with NVIDIA moving through the, the gaming space all the way up to now the industrial space as we've been evolving um, as a company and as a digital world. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today, uh, specifically around the metaverse, is when we, we traditionally, the first things that come to mind when I think about the metaverse um, is things like Ready Player One, right? You, you see a lot of um, kind of more media and entertainment uh, focus around the metaverse when you're in the news, etc. And we first started exploring this this uh, space about seven or eight years ago. We developed a product called, oddly enough, Holodeck, um, where we we wanted to be able to uh, take real-time design data, design data that was previously not able to be ran in real time in VR, and view it collaboratively. So, you know, put the headset on, talk to someone across the world, write some notes. And that was our first step. Um, and what was really interesting to us was this extreme hunger from like the design, the manufacturing, uh, the true rubber meets the road spaces for this type of technology. This ability to uh, get in there wherever I am in the world and really immersively view and review. Um, fast forward a little bit forward here, and what we're seeing now uh, in, in the industrial space is almost an existential crisis. Uh, when we look at the complexity of what we're building today, the needs around sustainability, net zero uh, emissions, um, and just the extreme efficiencies that are needed to generate the products that we want to you know, live and immerse ourselves in today, we knew that we had to start developing technologies and uh, engineering abilities that were beyond what was possible right now. Um, one of these key concepts is around, uh, and I'll kind of walk us through this vision, one of the key concepts around this is around the digital twin. The ability for not just one team or one person to do their work, but for the entire organization to work together on a single piece of data, a single digital twin, that is not only just the geometric representation, but is the simulation, the behavior, uh, the physical properties down to, you know, how the material behaves with light, radar, infrared, etc. So this is kind of the race to digitalize, where in this new uh, industrial metaverse, many of these technology leaders in automotive and healthcare, and simulation uh, are now having to 
work out ways to collaborate directly. So what we mean by this in, in, in very layman's terms is, is in the past, you would have a very long development cycle, right? You would have uh, the start of flushing something out, and then you'd make a change, and then it would go to simulation, and it just keeps going down the line. When we start building a digital twin that is in a unified data set, we can suddenly have all those teams working together at once. And if you make a single change uh, in the design team, I can instantly know how that affects my simulation. Um, and I'll have some more examples of that later, but when we started diving in on this with our partners of how do we make this possible, uh, here at NVIDIA, we leaned into our natural abilities. Uh, we have this ability in, in graphics and AI that we wanted to help build a platform to enhance everybody else's ability to get to the industrial metaverse faster. Um, you know, actually echoing uh, what Sue said earlier, we really did feel that, and we got really excited because we felt like we're just at that precipice. where We have the, the graphics technology, the simulation technology, um, and the infrastructure, that was the key, the infrastructure of compute in the cloud and our general ability to connect very well over the internet, which obviously with COVID-19 had to, you know, go leaps and bounds for us to truly collaborate together. We're like, we're here. The industrial metaverse is no longer a catchphrase or a term. Uh, we really feel like uh, now it is something that is real. And so we started building, we go to the next slide now, we started building the NVIDIA Omniverse platform. Um, and this is very much a platform that we, we are working with everybody to build on top of. Like I said, we, we are uh, focusing on our core competencies, which is the ability to um, render and simulate with AI uh, any amount of data, right? With, with real-time ray tracing, we're now able to lose geometric complexity as a bottleneck. Um, we can now render you know, billions and billions of polygons in real-time in VR, and that suddenly unlocks applications like walking through an entire factory in VR that were not, not really possible before without extreme amounts of either decimation or pipeline process, which just slows everything down, right? We just need to make everything faster and faster and faster. Um, and the other thing that we quickly discovered as we went down this path is that we all sort of need to start talking the same language. So that's where we really started with Omniverse is we adopted Universal Scene Description, USD. And what USD is, is it's our way to put the geometric, the simulation, the material properties of whatever you are building into a single data set that can be shared in multiple different tools. Um, we've now connected over 200 different uh, tools and when we're talking about Revit or Cesium or other different tools like that to to generate USD data. So now that we have this data, and we have this simulation platform, and we now have this ability to uh, have all this running in the same place and have the simulation together, now we can collaborate. And we can actually work together across the world in what we would like to think is a frictionless experience. And what's even more exciting about going to the 3D immersive world is there's a whole new generation of people that grew up on games. Like I grew up on games, I love video probably a little bit too much. But um, now, those new people entering the workforce, this is 100% natural to them. They've been doing this their whole lives. And this is, this is kind of the, the place that they play. Uh, so I want to show you guys a video real quick of how we have worked with one of our partners to kind of start uh, realizing the industrial metaverse. Um, at our GTC conference this year, we showed off a collaboration with BMW building um, a digital factory in Hungary uh, before it's even built, right? So we, we were able to both simulate, design, and uh, kind of go through it. So let's go ahead and show this video. Um, I get to talk over it. There was audio, but you listen to me instead. Uh, so what we're showing right now is, this is what we talked about, like disparate data. There's so many different tools that are needed to plan a factory. And if we're able to bring all these tools together make them speak the same language, suddenly all your teammates around the world can collaborate together. And making this frictionless by integrating it in say, things like Teams or any other things like that, we're able to, in real time, get onto the factory floor with our various colleagues that you see here. Each one of these colleagues has their own view into the uh, industrial metaverse of their BMW factory. 
and they're able to make decisions. So in this particular use case, they need to add a, a fourth robot. Right, so the planner who needs to move the bin, he can move it out, out of the way. I can pull the robot in. We can space it and be like, okay, you know, I think this works in this space. Um, but more importantly, now I can simulate it. All right, so if you're able to do this in real time and every one of those little cameras is their own individual view of the space and the scene, you can already start to visualize the immense uh, efficiency gains you can have in planning and execution. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide now. Oh, I guess it's playing the video again. Uh, you know, we're, we're working hard to try to unlock everybody to build on top of this platform. Uh, we see it as a great way to start moving into the industrial metaverse. Uh, we're working with uh, great companies like Deloitte as well uh, as one of our uh, partners on system integration. And we're very excited about how much this can unlock our future. Because we just know, with the, like I said, with the complexity and the sustainability of how large this world is becoming, how uh, efficient we need to be with all of our resources, that if we don't globalize and simulate before we start putting stuff down on paper, before we start building that factory, uh, we'll never reach those efficiency gains. So that's our, that's our look at the industrial metaverse from NVIDIA right now. Dana, question for you. Yeah, bring it on. Right. <laughs> you mentioned today's workforce or the incoming workforce is they're gamers or they're used yeah. to working in this type of environment. One of the observations I had about the industrial uh, metaverse was the real-time collaboration of persons with different backgrounds, different skill sets, different knowledge and the fact that that collaboration was happening at the same time. I think we all have uh, felt during the pandemic and since coming out of the pandemic and working in hybrid teams that it's great that we can be distributed and it's also challenging to have collaborative sessions. Can you talk for just a moment about the experience of these folks working in a collaborative environment through the digital technology? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, like, like I said, that the new workforce of gamers, they've, they've been in you know, World of Warcraft and stuff like that. They, they know how to talk on, on Discord and all of these. And uh, you know, one thing that we, we have generally seen um, with getting into the same collaborative space and being able to see where each, other's are, where each other are and how they're kind of looking at that, it's a whole different perspective than if we're, like I said, we're just talking to a Teams call, right? And we're all just looking at a schematic or we're all looking at a map. Um, the fact that I'm actually able to, when we get into these real-time immersive environments, especially in XR, XR is so incredibly immersive uh, when you can actually see that digital person there. Um, being able to see where their perspective is, how their body language is, uh, it gives you a much more accurate reading and a much more better look at how the data is being presented. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the most exciting thing for a lot of us is that we are able to now communicate more globally. You know, early in my career, you went into an office, maybe everybody's even in the same town. Um, but now I'm able to, you know, work with people across the world that have been brought up on different cultures, and they just bring such a different perspective. And being able to do that collaboratively in the same space, it just makes your work so much more effective, and you go down new paths that you didn't know about. Thanks, Dane, and I call that the diversity bonus. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, please capture your questions. We'll have a big Q&A session once we work through all three of our panelists. Next, I'd like to introduce Scott Lawler. Scott is the president and CEO of LP3, where he provides leadership and subject matter expertise to their customers in the areas of enterprise architecture, information assurance, security architecture, enterprise management operations. And prior to LP3, Scott was an Air Force officer as a cybersecurity leader, having impact standing up several cybersecurity plans, including the formation of the insurance, the information assurance vulnerability alert program. I think Scott also has direct ties to the GWINT community, having been the CISO for the National System for Geospatial Intelligence. Um, but 
from my personal culture perspective, one of the things I admire about you is the way you give back to the community. As a serving on the board of directors for Untrafficked, which is a nonprofit seeking to stop child sex trafficking across the country. And he also volunteers to deliver free cybersecurity awareness presentations to local businesses and community organizations that help people learn how to be safe and secure online. So with that, let me get your presentation up and uh, we'll be ready to go. I'm going to buy a new house in a year or two. And the reason I'm talking about this is my payment is going to be half of what yours is. How am I going to do that? Web3. This is going to make a huge difference around the world. And as we go through this, I'll explain how that's going to work. Next, please. First, let's talk about where we came from. Uh, this is the old client-server kind of mentality. Uh, how many of us geeks built a really horrible website on a home computer? Thank you for admitting you did that. Others of you should be embarrassed. Um, we created ugly websites that we use browsers to connect to with physical hardware. Next, please. The hardware looks something like this in our businesses and organizations, stacks and stacks of servers. Next, please. Next, please. We had lots of cables. We had routers and switches and firewalls to try and keep the hackers out of this stuff. This is the late 90s, early 2000s of client-server environment. This is where we came from. Next, please. We're kind of in the Web 2 era now. This era is a little bit different where we've got all kinds of devices accessing systems and services with their browsers. We've also got smart applications that are accessing things by APIs. We're focused on data centers. We're focused on virtual hosting and infrastructure as a service and platform as a service and software as a service and application as a service. Think about all of that stuff. Next, please. Hosted in places like Google. Next, 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 next. That's it. Uh, Google still hosts 15% of the sites on the internet. Uh, Amazon is up to about 11%. One in one who's headquartered in Europe is about 7% now. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of companies that have sprung up that do secondary hosting or additional services to, again, make those data center facilities more useful cloud service environments around the world. Microsoft, for example, stands up new Azure data centers frequently uh, all over the place. This one happens to be in Europe. The thing about where we are now, we're in the cloud world. We're in the data center world. That world's going to get upset a little bit with Web3. Next, please. What's different about Web3 is we're going to mobile to mobile, edge computing. And what's different about this is it's direct, endpoint to endpoint, encrypted tunnel in between. There's no data center in the middle. There's no centralized hosting. There's no cloud. There's no centralized content control. There's no content moderation anywhere. And there's encryption from the endpoint to the endpoint. Very strong encryption. Next, please. And all of these devices are going to be connected around the world with strong encryption, endpoint to endpoint. Next, please. Devices of all different types, mobile devices, desktop devices, tablets. Uh, the one on the top left up there is the most popular tablet in China and India today. There are going to be billions of those added to this global internet service environment where all of these edge devices will be sharing products, services, financial capabilities between themselves, edge device to edge device. That's the difference about Web3. Next, please. So, how does this work? So, here's my iPhone on the left side there. I'm going to buy my house. What do I do? I open up my digital financial app. My digital financial app that millions of other people around the world happen to have on their phones, too. Next, please. I say I need a loan to buy a house. And there are say 200,000 of those people that are going to loan me a couple of euros, a couple of yen, a couple of rubles, because with encrypted communications, this data goes right through those firewalls. Around the world, people can now participate in the financial community 
where they may not be able to today. And those people are going to give me a loan for 2 or 3%. Or I could go to my local U.S. provider and get 10 or 15% because of what the federal government's doing to interest rates right now. Which one am I going to choose? I'm going to let my friends around the world with their mobile apps give me a loan. What is this going to do to the financial community? It's going to pull the rug out from under them. Not just in the U.S., but around the globe. Next, please. Next. Another example, if I have a huge compute task that needs to get done, I'm going to take my phone out and I'm going to take a video of everybody in the room and do automatic facial recognition, social media research, trend analysis, look up all your backgrounds and do the SF86 background check, all that done before it gets back in my pocket. How do I do that? I have 20,000 of my friends out on the internet that have sold me a fraction of the compute time on their cell phone CPUs. I've got massive distributed computing functionality, endpoint to endpoint. I don't need to do that in a data center. I don't need to get somebody's permission to set that up. It's a market, online market, Web3, point-to-point -point services. These things are coming to your phone soon. Next, please. Global impact. This is a big deal. Next. One of the early things that we're seeing already in the gaming community is they're starting to do point-to-point -point services where there are different kinds of interactions that are going to be happening that we haven't seen before. Uh, and, and banking is just an example of one of those. Next, please. Quantum-proof encryption is rapidly approaching. Uh, there are some services already available now where this encryption is, is better than the decryption capabilities that uh, governments around the world have today. And this is going to cause a problem later that I'll get to in a minute. Next, please. Global financial disruption I already talked about. Today, people use SWIFT, they use ACH, they use wires to transfer money from point A to point B. You won't have to do that in the future. I'll be able to exchange value with somebody in another country and automatically go through a stable coin and I get dollars and they get whatever they want. And it doesn't matter, it's point to point. Automatic uh, currency uh, transactions. There's no bank, there's no government involved, there's no taxes that automatically get deducted. It's point-to-point -point transactions. There's going to be a lot of disruption with Web3 technology. Next, please. Borderless commerce, I kind of already talked about. Next, please. International trade is going to skyrocket. International crime is probably going to skyrocket too because criminal organizations are going to realize, oh, I can send money back and forth this way, and it's not tracked. Next, please. My last point, this technology is going to blind governments. What I mean by that is they're not going to be able to track and see financial transactions. They won't be able to tell that I bought or sold something because that's an encrypted point-to-point -point value uh, uh, transfer that I make with whoever I buy or sell a product to. And this is a huge deal to governments all around the world because they will lose visibility that they have today that they re rely on today to see what all of us are spending money on. Uh, the Fed uh, just started a new program called Fed Now, where they're doing 24-hour uh, transaction processing and monitoring. They don't mention the monitoring part of that. They also reduced the dollar amount that banks have to report down to $600 now. It used to be 10000 Governments are monitoring more and more, and Web3 blinds them to that. So the key message I want to leave you with is, when I buy my new house, I'm going to get a really good loan rate because I'm going to use my Web3 friends spread out all around the globe. The Web3 is end-to-end -end and no longer through those data centers. Thank you. Scott, thank you very much. So I was really taken by your point about Web3 as being mobile-to-mobile -mobile edge computing, really doing that computing at the edge. I'm curious about what you think about space as the next frontier, and edge computing in space, will it be the next web four? It could be, and one of the things happening in space is that it is the new uh, commercial capabilities like Starlink popping up around the globe and other providers 
are going to provide different communication paths for Web3 services to interact, and they're not going to be able to be controlled by the various governments that wish to control that anymore. Uh, the, the internet is going to become more free and more open in the next few years, and we're seeing that happen already. Sort of the death of transparency. Correct. Thank you. All right, I'd next like to introduce Mark Donovan. Mark is the Global Director of Digital and AI Solutions Group at Nestle Purina Pet Care R&D Network. Through his work at Purina, Mark aspires to make the lives of pets and all of us who care about pets, to make them better and more fulfilling. He accomplishes this through digital products for pets that use AI to translate pet data into meaningful insights. Prior to joining Nestle Purina, Mark also enjoyed a 19-year career in the U.S. Air Force as a logistics officer and served in the Air Force Reserve as a command officer. Mark and I both share a great passion for CrossFit and living a healthy lifestyle. Over to you, Mark. How's everybody doing? Okay. So I apologize for standing in front of you. Maybe a little bit less uh, tech impressive, but I'm anxious and excited to share a little bit about the AI-enabled tech space that Purina is actively engaged in. And we'll pull some slides up here momentarily. So think of this as pet meta. Next slide. But first, we have to talk about pets. How many, how many dog owners, cat owners do we have in the audience? Show of hands. Yes, ah, I love it. Uh, how many of you wish you knew what they were doing right now? A few. <laughs> is, it a, is it a mystery? If you're a dog owner, they're probably a couch potato. It's probably a couch potato. Cat owner's probably trying to figure out how to piss off the dog, right? Uh, do something like, like that. Um, for those of you that are pet owners, just from the audience, Describe for me, just throw out some words for me that describe the relationship that you have with your pets. Chaos. Okay. Sub, uh, who is subservient to who? To, to them. Okay. What else? Codependent. Unconditional love. Yes. How many of you look at your pets and you think family? You think kids, right? Or ornery teenagers, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very normal in, the, in this pet owning society that we live in for us to uh, anthropomorphize, to humanize our pets. And as a result of that, uh, our world is experiencing a massive pet products industry. It's, it's quite impressive. How many of you that have pets are feeding Purina products to your pets? Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, for those of you that didn't raise your hands on that question, but did to say you have pets, you, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to step out for the next few minutes. Now, actually, you are my target audience for tonight because I want I want to get you on the Purina bandwagon. Um, let me introduce you to one of my pets. This is Jocko Donovan. Uh, named after a really badass Navy SEAL named Jocko Willink. Is there a resemblance there? I think so. I think so. I love this picture. Um, and in his more lighter moments, next please, this is Sebastian Bach doing his impression of Sebastian Bach, the lead singer from Skid Row. Those of you that are old like me will remember Skid Row from the 80s, uh, but that is my youngest son's fiance uh, leveraging her her hair to have some fun with uh, Sebastian Bark at, at my house. We love our pets like family too. If you ever get a chance to come to Purina, you're going to see dogs across the campus every day. It's, it's, it's quite an amazing place to work. Next. Before I talk about Pet Meta, let me just talk for a moment about Purina. So Purina's global headquarters is right here in St. Louis. Purina was founded right here in St. Louis by this guy, William H. Danforth. He was an entrepreneur before entrepreneurism was a thing. Uh, about, uh, let's go back in time, 100, 120 years, that's a photo of the riverfront right here in St. Louis. Those barges loaded up, uh, that would be the arch grounds today. 
Um, at that time, St. Louis was the hub for westward expansion, right? And this guy, a young entrepreneur who was into health and fitness, bless you, he was into health and fitness uh, again before that was a thing. And he was watching all of these animals pulling carts, offloading all the goods from these ships. And he had an idea, which was, uh, or he had an observation that led to an idea, which was these, these animals, horses, donkey, oxen, they're an important part of the economic engine of our community at that time. Uh, and he watched people feeding them slop, leftovers, very not nutritious at all types of food. And his idea, as, a, as somebody that understood human nutrition, was why, what if I made a product that was nutritionally formulated for the needs of those pets, and we could make them healthier, more productive, more vibrant members uh, of, of this economic engine uh, and, and really help drive us. And so he created a company called, which now is called Purina Mills. It's not part of our dog and cat Purina any longer. Uh, but if you drive the highways of the U.S. and you see the checkerboard on silos, that's the company originally that William Danforth founded. Uh, in the 1920s, as pet ownership became a thing, he started formulating food for dogs and cats as well, and that's turned into an enormously large industry that, uh, uh, that continues to grow and grow. Next, please. AI at Purina is everywhere, just like it is, I'm sure, in all of your businesses, right? We are renting AI, we are buying AI, we are building AI across all of our various uh, functional disciplines in our company. But I wanna talk a little bit today just about this space, this emerging space of pet tech. I brought actually a newly launched product with me today. I'll talk a little bit about that. In the pet care category, again, it's an enormous category, $150 billion global category growing at an annual rate of about 5%. And that's been consistent for a very, very long time. Uh, pet food's very big. Purina is the number one pet food manufacturer in the US is one or two in just about every, every other company in the world. So we've got quite a presence in the food space. It's what we know, it's what we do. That's been our DNA. There are uh, about almost approaching a billion dogs and cats in homes as pets in the world today. That's quite impressive. There are more uh, dogs and cats in homes in the US today than there are children. Pretty amazing, huh? Most of you are like, I, I totally understand. If, if you're a parent, right, you get that. Um, this smart pet tech space today is about a $3 billion industry globally projected to quadruple over the next five years. And again, as you look at the human health and fitness and wearable uh, world, right, pet, pet industry is following quickly behind that. The opportunity for us in pet is, this, uh, is in this space of personalization. We love our pets like family. We invest a lot of time, energy, money in them, but a fundamental insight that we've, we've learned and see over and over repeated is pet owners uh, have this underlying lack of confidence that we're doing the best thing for our pet, that we're doing the right thing. And we believe that technology today now enables us to gain insight into the predictive health needs of our pets that we can't see. And so we're building a business around that. The generalized model that we follow, we're developing a lot of AI, particularly in the IoT or smart device space for pets. Uh, the general model that we're building around is this idea of data in, inside out, where the types of data, uh, particularly, it, well, in IoT and in the diagnostic spaces, we're gonna ask you to build a profile of your pet if it's an IoT device, we're gonna connect, collect a lot of sensor data. It's a diagnostic test, right? We're gonna do a test and send it to a laboratory. Uh, we're also getting lots of federated and other types of third-party data as inputs. The AI magic happens in between. Uh, I can tell you about it, but then I'd have to turn a, a herd of wild Dobermans loose on you afterwards uh, so that we're sure that you wouldn't share it with anybody. But ultimately, what we're looking for is to leverage AI, to develop AI that takes these input, data inputs that we can get 
from an individual pet and output for us very personalized insights about the pet's behavior, health, nutrition needs that are unique to, to your pet, to that pet. That data, uh, the AI that we, that, we, um, that we built and use in our model uh, is focused really in two areas. One, telling us what's happening every time we detect an event. So if you think of a smart collar, a smart food bowl, I have a smart litter box device here that goes under your cat's litter box. Every time that's used, every time there's movement, we're acquiring data. We have a portfolio of AI that's going to be assessing that event data. Then we're trending that data over time, how those, how those event patterns are changing, and we're building platforms of AI then that are assessing what do these changes and patterns mean, which ones are significant, which ones are predictive of health problems that pet owners or vets need to know about or would care about. This is a snapshot of Purina's current uh, commercial digital product portfolio, a lot of products out there. They generally fall into uh, three categories. One I would call direct-to-consumer, so this would be either websites or apps where you would go in and answer some questions about your pet, and we would make a personalized product recommendation for your pet for you, for you to purchase, and I'll, sh I'll highlight one of those in just a moment. Uh, next is uh, diagnostic products. Uh, we have uh, PetQ Check. In the top left, this is an example of one where you can order from, from us a microbiome diagnostic test kit. So you'll get the joy of taking a swab of your pet's poop and sending it to the lab for us. Uh, we'll be able to analyze that and understand uh, the population of the microbiome uh, bacteria that live in your pet. We'll know what good, what good bacteria is there, what bad bacteria is there and we'll make uh, supplement recommendations to you through that website that will optimize the health of your pet's uh, gut biome. As just like in humans, if your, if your gut bacteria isn't happy, you're not going to be very happy or healthy. Uh, and so this is an interesting uh, value proposition where uh, the target consumer is really the bacteria, but we know the pet's going to benefit if the bacteria is happy and healthy. The last, uh, the last type of uh, product that you'll see in our ecosystem today are our smart devices or IoT devices. Uh, we, you won't see much in market today uh, from us. We've got a lot coming in the pipeline over the next year or two. Uh, the cat litter, litter box monitoring device that I've got here uh, is one that you can go out and look at online, order online, and have underneath your cat's litter boxes uh, probably by the end of this week. Next slide, please. So one example, I'll call this AI Light. Uh, we have two products uh, in market. Uh, one in the US is called Just Right by Purina, so that's justrightpetfood.com. Uh, in Europe, in pr primarily in the UK, we have a company called tails.com. We acquired that. We built Just Right, we acquired tails.com. Both of them are solving a very similar uh, value proposition where you'll come in and answer a lot of questions about your dog. We've got an AI engine that will run in the background that will custom formulate uh, a, a, a product based on the nutritional needs of your pet. We'll give you opportunities to identify uh, the preferred protein source uh, for that, any other added ingredients. You even get to upload a picture of your pet and you get to name the product so that as you see here with Bailey's blend, Bailey's picture is on the label and uh, it will come to your house in a couple of days. A very nice uh, premium custom product designed just for Bailey's nutrition needs. We do the same with tails.com, but you don't get to name it and you don't get a, to put a picture on it if you live in the UK. Next. This is probably a little bit more uh, Technically complicated types of AI, there's a ton of behavior classification uh, modeling that's been done in our smart litter box monitoring system. So imagine this device underneath your cat's litter box. There are a series of sensors in there. There's an array of load cells, uh, an IMU, so we're getting uh, Excel, accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer data every time your cat's 
using the litter box this data is streaming. In addition, we've had you fill out a profile of your pet in the app and uh, our AI then, every time that box is used, will run through a portfolio of models. First, we'll predict, do we think it's a cat that's generating the data? Or do we think it's you generating the data because you're cleaning the cat? No, you're not using the cat box, but you're probably cleaning the cat box, hopefully. Uh, or um, it's something else, uh, a baby crawling by the litter box, hopefully not. Uh, the washing machine running because it's in the laundry room. Uh, that may create vibrations that the sensors will pick up, right? And so we've got AI that's going to predict, is it the cat? Is it a person? Is it something else? We've got AI that's going to predict in a home with more than one cat, which cat is it? You don't have to put something on the collar of the cat. We're not doing visual recognition. We have AI that learns the signature of how your cat moves, right? Which is unique to each, to each animal. Uh, and so we'll predict which cat it is. Uh, we'll be able to tell, is it actually using the litter box to go to the bathroom to eliminate? And if it is, is it urinating or defecating? Or is it in the litter box to do something else? And you can Google uh, Purina cat elimination behavior and you're gonna see research papers from some of my colleagues where we've identified that urinating and defecating are only two of about 30 or 40 different behaviors that we know cats do in their litter boxes. They do strange things in their litter boxes. Um, so we'll predict that. Um, if it's, if it's a, a person, right, we're able to classify or identify if you're scooping the litter box. And we can tell if different people are scooping the litter box based on how you scoop, based on how you move, uh, and, right? And so this gives us as well now a lens into human behavior in the home and the family in addition to uh, the data that we're acquiring from the pet. And all of this classification data then gives us the opportunity to trend over time to identify predictive health risks. Is this animal, is this cat, uh, is it gaining weight to the point where uh, it needs to be on a weight management formula? Of course, we're going to recommend just the right food for, for the cat. Uh, but we certainly will be are able to identify uh, chronic kidney disease, urinary, urinary tract kinds of problems. Uh, today in the U.S., we know of the approximately 100 million cats that live in homes, about a fifth of them, 20 million cats, have kidney disease and nobody knows it yet. And by the time the pet owner knows there's a problem and they go to the vet, that cat's probably, the vet's probably going to tell the cat owner that that cat's lost 50 to 70 percent of its kidney function permanently, right? Anybody that's had cats uh, uh, through, their, through their lifetime, uh, has probably dealt with cats with urinary tract problems, kidney disease, things like that. Eight out of 10 cats are going to experience uh, kidney problems uh, as, they, as they reach their senior year. So it's a major problem. The vets will tell you though, if they know these problems are happening earlier, there's a lot they can do to delay the onset or to manage the disease. Uh, but in most cases today, vets Lack, having lacked a tool will tell you that by the time you come in with your cat, 80% loss of kidney function, uh, there's not much the vet can do but help you manage the symptoms and keep the cat comfortable through the remainder of its lifetime. So this product we're really excited about. It really offers the opportunity for us as kind of our first smart device entry into the pet products space not only uh, to be a good business for Purina, but probably more exciting to the team that's working on it. It's an opportunity to save the lives of a lot of cats, which, is, uh, which makes it nice when you get up and come to work in the morning thinking you're doing something, something that good uh, for, for animals that we care about. And next, that may be it. Okay, thank you very much, you've been great. Mark, that was great. And your presentation was so very different from the rest of us. We all had a little something, but really fascinating. And I know attracted the attention of so many of us who are pet owners. Question I have, uh, in the intelligence community or in the intelligence world, predicting the behaviors and actions of foreign adversaries, um, doing fraud detection, 
illegal act activities is so critically important. And when you talk about AI, one of the issues that we tend to question or wonder about is bias in the models. So I'm curious with all the modeling that you're doing, how is Purina addressing the issue of bias in the models? Uh, it, it's definitely something that we pay a lot of close attention to as we're training models, uh, trying to manage and eliminate that bias. We have, uh, for example, uh, in, in the space of developing something new, we've got pet care centers full of dogs and cats who, who are professional taste testers of foods, right? So our U.S. pet care center uh, for Purina is located in St. Joseph, Missouri, just north of Kansas City. And I've got access to about a thousand dogs and cats in total that we've also turned into uh, professional training data generators, right? And so we've put videos, video cameras throughout that facility. We can have them wearing or using devices 24 seven. We're recording everything. I've got a team of behaviorists that's then labeling that, that data a competitive advantage for us having that. And as a result, we're able to make, to create some really impressive supervised learning data sets, right? That give us a great head start right out of the gate. Now, once these models are in the wild, we're relying heavily on our engagement and feedback from people to tell us whether we're picking the right cat, predicting the right cat or predicting the right behavior. A little bit more challenging in that unsupervised space. A fascinating way to use subject matter experts yes. <laughs> in the building of that data. Well, thank you all very, very much. And now we'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Questions, comments. I knew there'd be one. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Leek. Um, Sorry, I missed your name, but the gentleman talking about the Web3 and especially the, the kind of micro lending, considering that banks are already making these loans with other people's money and are heavily regulated and have teams um, validating these loans and, and qualifying these loans before they're given out, how is that kind of distributed micro loan system not just pushing risk onto individuals? And, and ultimately putting that loan that you're buying your house with at risk. You stated that like that's a risk. I'm gonna turn the tables on you and say, I'm running a gun shop and I go to Bank of America for a loan. Bank of America says no, because they're against guns. So the, the banking industry is causing some of this blowback by trying to manipulate consumer behavior. And the federal government is also getting involved with that to some extent by telling the, the banks that they have to give certain kinds of loans in certain kinds of areas, even if those loans don't meet their appropriate risk criteria. So there's some artificial manipulation going on in the banking industry that is causing some people to say, I want to make my own financial decisions. And in Africa, the microloan industry is exploding, where there are people with a cell phone that'll say, you know, I need $5 to buy a couple of chickens so that I can sell eggs. And, and those people are, are taking a huge risk making those microloans to people that may not be able to pay them back and have no business sense whatsoever. But that's a huge growing business. And small businesses are popping up all over Africa in that, uh, I'll call it risky environment that our U.S. banks would never invest in because it's too risky for them. So there's two sides to the coin. Is there, is there room for regulation? Probably. Will it happen? Probably not because Web3 is decentralized. Uh, and it'll be up to the user to decide whether they want to invest in that particular uh, offering or not. Thanks, Scott. More questions? Hi, I had a question for the NVIDIA Omniverse stuff. Who is the 
is there a target audience that NVIDIA has in mind for Omniverse? Is it large companies? Is it uh, like purely large companies? Is it also like startups? Is it individual like people at home? Uh, do, do you have a target audience? And if you do, um, do you have any sort of like uh, training or tutorial set up for uh, users for that? No, that's a that's a great question. Um, we have we have multiple when it comes to Omniverse. Uh, obviously, we have we have cloud offering, which is going to be more targeted towards large large businesses. But we also have uh, what we call roughly OVI, which is Omniverse Individual, and that's more targeted towards uh, you know small companies who want to do small collaboration events. Individuals, um, we've seen a lot of pickup uh, with like the access to such a nice renderer and like the small AEC architecture uh, visualization space. So we do have kind of like that modeling towards everyone. Um, the beauty of being able to uh, use USD and, and starting to get on that Omniverse platform, even if you are an individual, is that that data format is actually exploding through like a lot of the other industries. Um, if you're in architecture space, you know, uh, a lot of the visualization tools, Unreal, et cetera, they all support USD now. Um, and we have uh, the ability for smaller individual teams to use something called Nucleus, which is our uh, how we transfer the data back and forth. So you're able to set up kind of like, you know, work to get a Nucleus set up going and, and kind of work collaboratively. So we do offer both models. So I, I have a question. So we're all aware of the technology adoption cycle, right? The early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and then the never adopters. I'm curious as to what you all see as the time frame for the early majority to start getting involved in and really adopting this technology. Uh, on my side, um, you know, some of you guys may have read a book called like Crossing the Chasm. Right, it is talking about that that early adopters and how do you jump and jump over that that chasm to uh, move forward. Um, we're seeing that honestly, we're starting to see it right now. You know, we, we're seeing that the if we look at the headsets that are available, the quality of the headsets that are available, um, the quality of rendering, so the the availability of the actual hardware to make this comp, uh, accomplished, and then finally the appetite. Um, from the community to move towards, you know, the idea of a metaverse. Uh, I don't think this one's going to fizzle. I think we're we're about to jump. So, uh, Web three technology is still uh, early adopter phase right now, but it is rapidly expanding, and it's going to likely expand in the developing nations much faster than it will here in the U.S. Uh, because th that's where the need is the highest for people that want economic freedom, where they have massive inflation of their government currencies. Uh, so I think that's where that's going to start uh, blooming first. I'll use the pet IoT product space or the smart device space uh, as, as an example. I saw the first smart dog collars come out about 10 years ago, I think, other companies doing this. And here we are 10 years later with 100 million dogs in homes today in the U.S. And I don't think any one company yet has an installed user base of a million, right? They, nobody's figured it out yet. And as I've looked at, the, at, at this category, it's not the technology, it's not the ability to, to make predictive health types of insights, but I think the gap that we continue to see is companies haven't figured out a user experience that really engages the pet owner in a meaningful way. Uh, and I think this is a solvable problem that I certainly would love for Purina to be part of solving, but I have to imagine that uh, you know we're three to five years away from stepping through that chasm and having companies really start to deliver an experience that's, that's truly meaningful for pet owners, for vets, for breeders, for shelter networks, et cetera. One question comes from online uh, for the gentleman from Perina. Uh, how does it, uh, what does it mean for pets who are in training or uh, 
or for service animals in the field, so devices that are more disconnected or on the edge, per se? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, it's a great question. There's so many places we can go with this. Uh, for training, pet tech offers lots of opportunities for remote types of training opportunities for pets. Uh, the ability to uh, track pets' performance against commands uh, where, when you can see them and when you can't, uh, depending on what type of job those, those pets might be doing. And I've lost the second half of that question. Service animals. Thank you. Uh, yeah, again, service animals, uh, a great opportunity for the training elements of the service animals as well as tracking their performance and their ability to serve. One of the areas that we are looking at, uh, and I think this is an area that has relevance with service animals, is this human, an human animal bond, human animal interaction, right? I'm wearing my own wearable. I can have my service dog wearing its wearable, and the technology can certainly be uh, assessing how we're interacting together and based on or relative to the service dog's role and job, how well it's performing that relative to the AI's interpretation of, of that data. Before I hand the mic over, uh, I, will, I will add just, just one build because this is a really relevant discussion for us, right? We're a food manufacturing company. I spend much of my time trying to convince executives in our company who have made their living making and selling pet food and don't understand technology at all. Uh, and so a big piece of the gap for me is informing, educating uh, leadership. Uh, I can't wait for the next generation to come. Of course, that means that I won't be here either. Uh, but uh, right, really gaining, having leaders that understand the technology and then leveraging that to, be, to enable the funding that's required that's sadly lacking, right? It's easy if, if I, uh, I walk into our CEO's office and say, hey, I want 10 million to do this. The calculus that's happening in their head is, and I can see the thought bubble is, okay, you know, I know Mark, I trust Mark, but I don't know if I'm ever gonna see a return on that investment. But if I plow that into one of our food brands, I can tell you right now what I'm gonna get out of, out of that investment uh, as a return. Two aspects, I think, will impede uh, a new technology adoption. Uh, one of the things is communications, high bandwidth communications. And that's rapidly changing with 5G uh, and space-based internet. Uh, that's going to open up the aperture for, for broader adoption faster. In government, I think technology literacy is going to continue to be a barrier. And we see that in the security community where they understand a technology to a certain level, but anything new they perceive as higher risk from a cybersecurity perspective. And it takes cybersecurity professionals to properly advocate uh, for the right security controls applied to this new technology so the government uh, authorization official understands that it's okay to accept that risk. And, and raising them up to a level of, of technical literacy on the new technology is really important to removing that barrier. Yeah, that's a, it's a really fantastic question because I feel like I talk about it for like five hours. But um, I'll pick just a couple verticals. I don't want you all here that long. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the, the big adopting issues is just compute power, right? I mean, if we look at, um, you know, either through edge computing or through cloud computing, uh, a lot of the ability to run these simulations, visualize this world, I mean, it, it's incredibly complex. And you need to, kind of to both their points here, you have to be able to frame it in uh, what's the value proposition, right? Like what is, you know, paying for, uh, you know, this large data center, Azure data center going to give me when it comes to either efficiency, operating efficiency, design efficiency, et cetera. Um, so that is going to be one of the impediments, just straight up getting people in the right mindset. Uh, one big thing with what we see with both, what I would see actually with Web3 as well, but with, with current Web2 is um, moving people's mindset from, uh, you know, capital expenditure to like operating expenditure and moving them more from that, that CapEx to OpEx because once we're able to get people to start moving their computing 
into those spaces, we'll have more computing available to actually make this possible. Um, you know, one final note uh, on the technology side, because um, you're talking about like a holodeck very specifically, uh, when it came to XR and VR, um, which I'll just talk just real briefly about, one of the largest adoption issues has been, um, if you're familiar with that space at all, is first, first resolution. I mean, we're used to our phones right now. These phones don't look any better, right? They're all retina displays for the past five or six years. The headsets are just getting there, where the, the PPD, the actual quality of those headsets is actually becoming human eye quality. And to do that, um, I mean, this is 8K per eye, and you need to render a virtual world at 8K per eye. Just think about how much compute power that is, like, you know, like a nuclear reactor type of thing. Um, so how do we enhance that? And, and we do actually have a lot of good strategies. With AI, we're able to infer a lot of how things are rendered. Um, with this latest cycle, this latest GPU cycle, uh, now this is going to be a gaming reference, but it's very relevant to how you render the metaverse world, we're able to generate frames through AI. So I only render one, and then I can generate automatically two, three, four frames um, that are just simply inferred. So now I've doubled my frame rate, tripled my frame rate, increased my resolution. That starts to unlock. So, you know, get that cloud computing going, get, get those data centers going, and, uh, you know, enhance all that through AI, and you're really going to start unlocking that visualization. I'm going to give a slightly different answer. So as a human-centered person, I think the greatest challenge is at the intersection of the human-machine team with one word called trust. And in the immersive environments that we're talking about where the human-machine team is truly one team, the trust that the humans need to feel about the technology not, that, not only that the technology will work well or that the technology will help produce accurate results, but that I as a human can trust that I feel the same me or that I feel comfortable operating in this environment. When I was as director of analysis, the number of times when we were talking about moving into AI and computer vision and analysts were saying, I was a political science major, I was a history major, I was a geography major because I don't do science, technology, engineering, and math. And that fear of working with technology because I don't do that, I think is probably one of the largest barriers to fast adoption in this technology world. I think the technology will happen much more quickly than the humans are gonna be ready to feel comfortable in that trust. Uh, I'll just quickly say, I think one of the easiest um, and most common ways that organizations are addressing these issues is through training, trying to upskill, reskill, to partner folks with training. And I would argue that is important and not yet sufficient. There's a culture aspect that I have to feel free to fail. I have to feel free to trust in my teammate who is of a different background or maybe is not physically with me in this multiverse world. And so I've got to have a, cul a culture of inclusivity, of psychological safety right, in order to, I think, really em embrace, have the humans embrace this technology with all the skills that they might have if they still fear that if they fail or they misuse the technology, not for nefarious purposes, but because they're just uncertain of how to make it work, um, that they won't want to use it because they fear that that's going to be bad for their assessment and you know how they did, performed over the year or something like that. Um, you know, two two relevant examples that we we kind of see going on right now is you know the explosion of Chat GPT and uh, stable diffusion with AI generated images. Um, I can't speak exactly to what our ethics committees are doing inside the company, but uh, I, I have a team of artists in my team, and when Stable Diffusion came out, and you were able to suddenly just you know type in and have a rather beautiful image that I could never make my own, uh, it was scary, right? It was scary for a lot of people. They, they originally um, were concerned, like, where's my job's going to be gone type of thing. 
but but what we really quickly realize is that a lot of these uh, technologies are enabling technologies. They actually should be able to enhance your ability to be creative, enhance your ability to get your job done, and uh, understanding how to frame those technologies in those ways is, is one of the best ways to kind of get that through the human, the human problem. Um, but uh, probably a lot more I could talk on that, but that, those two particular examples really hit home to me recently. You ask a really good question, and I'm, I'm going to take a, a different approach to it. From a cybersecurity perspective, there are going to be unethical people out there. There are going to be unethical bad actors operating on our systems. And what we need to do is to design in the right security controls so those unethical people can't do unethical acts. Or they're fully audited so that they can be held accountable for the unethical acts that they've done. And these are system design choices that need to be made early on uh, in every system. But I think it's important to realize that whatever we build, people are going to do bad things with it. And we need to take that into account. Ethics is uh, certainly in the, in the pet care, pet food business that we're in is a very relevant and important topic. Uh, our core business as a food manufacturer requires and relies on us not doing anything, not selling any products to a pet owner that's going to do harm to a pet, right? Certainly that's going to hit the news cycle very quickly. Uh, and as a brand, as a company, uh, not have, a good, not have a, a good result for us. Um, as, as we enter this space of pet care and we get into these types of, of products, right, we, uh, first and foremost, we're really passionate about these, this portfolio of products being intended to help pets, not to harm them, right? We're here to do good to enable you to have a better, longer relationship with your pet. And so we take, we take this, this point of ethics very seriously as, as we develop products, we have uh, a team of animal behaviorists that works with our product teams, if it's a physical product or a diagnostic test, and we're going to evaluate uh, all the safety act aspects of both animal and human interaction with a hard good, a device, if you will, uh, as well if we're asking, a lot of, asking you to enter a lot of information about your pet, uh, while pets are considered property property by law. They don't have humanhood, so they're not legally, uh, you know, the, the laws of personally identifiable information don't legally apply to them. We're going to treat them in that user experience with you as if they are human, and we're going to ask for your permission for us to be able to use the data for the purposes of delivering the user experience that you've, uh, that you've paid for, uh, as well as asking if you're willing to allow us to use that data uh, through what we think of as a citizen scientist community helping us to do, to use that data to do even better good uh, for pets. Yeah, so I think your question is, how do we get this technology inside the four walls of the SCIF? Um, yeah, I don't... Uh, We've gone through this a lot as well, right? Because I mean, some of these companies that we're working with right now uh, on the industrial side, I mean, it's it's locked down hard. Like I can't even get certain headset devices in the door because they're worried about you know phoning home, et cetera. Um, building that metaverse in like an air gap situation is it's still very beneficial, right? Where you can still have this close loop air gap. Uh, so as long as this this technology is portable. Um, at least with with uh, like the Omniverse system, we're able to just like basically plop an Omniverse wherever you want, and now suddenly you're able to just work, right? So um, I don't think the metaverse necessarily has to be a single system that's across the the world, right, to be beneficial. I think it really can just be um, in your local air gap situation. The other way that the metaverse can be extended into the high side is with effective cross-domain information flow systems, where today the IC d tries to move all of the internet uh, up to JWIX, and it, it's just not practical to do that. And I think the same thing happens true where there's uh, feature foundation data, for example, that can stay on the low side 
and be accessed from the high side to give those high side users a rich metaverse experience where they're, they're uh, interacting with unclassified objects as well as uh, classified objects on the high side. It's the, the key is, is cross-domain solutions. Uh, I'll just add, I, I'm excited about what's happening out here in St. Louis. I'm excited about what NGA is building with their new campus that will be very much more flexible and moving from high side to secret to low side and back and forth. I think there's opportunities for experimentation. I'm excited about what's going on in St. Louis with the, what I call the rent a skiff, right? which is also creating new opportunities and ways for places where you can go and do high side. And so, you know, perhaps a, a great T-Rex type of innovation project would be to start looking at how do you bring this technology into the skiff environment um, through what's uh, available here in the St. Louis area. So with that, I think we want to thank everybody for attending. Again, I want to thank Riverside Research and the T-Rex for hosting these events, and I especially want to thank our panelists for the discussion. It was really very fascinating. Thanks. Thank you.